Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Uh, this is focusing on the kingdom concept of transformation and the kingdom principle of transformation. I want every young person to listen especially carefully because you are the key to what's going to happen in the next 40 years in the world. And if you learn this, what I'm going to share with you today, you're going to be more effective in your contribution to the world. I want to begin with a quick review of what we talked about in my last session with you. And that is the conditions of the world today. When I was in, in Brazil recently, and the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church was there, every day both of us were in the news in, in uh, Brazil. And during his last day in Brazil, he held a press conference. In that press conference, the Pope was asked a question concerning same-sex marriage and homosexuality. And then for the first time ever in my lifetime have I heard a Pope who spoke in a way that was very much of deep concern. What disturbed me the most, and I say it publicly, is that the Pope gave his personal opinion. You know, as a man of God, and as a representative of Christ, when we are in official capacities, we are not allowed to give our personal opinion on issues that the Bible has already spoken on. Do you understand that? If I am not in official capacity and I chat with you, you know, at a dinner table somewhere and you ask me my thoughts on something, I might give you my thoughts. But when I am standing in an official capacity, I have no right to give my opinion on something God has already given his judgment on. So the requirement of a leader in the body of Christ who claims to represent the word of God Jesus Christ and his father Jehovah is that we must always maintain the integrity of the position of scripture no matter how much the waves may beat against us or how the currents may come against us and I'm talking about current affairs which means the changing tide of our social lives, we must never compromise with the scriptures already spoken on. And this to me is very serious. And so I was very disappointed, and I think we are going to feel the repercussions of the Pope's statement for years to come, and most of it, I believe, well, we will not recover from. Because there are people who are waiting for credibility and affirmation of their perspectives of life by people who others respect. And I am very, very concerned, and personally, no one to me is greater than Jesus Christ. No one is above the Bible, and no human is smarter than God. So I am not going to submit to anyone's title at the expense of sacrificing the integrity of God. Now, let me explain to you what I believe is happening. And it's this word conformity. Write it down. The pressure of conformity is what's happening today. The United Nations is one of the most dangerous organizations on earth today because it itself has gone through a transformation that it was not created to be. Those of you who are old enough would remember that the United Nations was formed right after World War II. 
when the nations saw millions of people killed in the battlefield in their countries and mankind out of his national guilt decided we don't want to fight anymore let's talk our problems out so they formed an organization called the United Nations which was a evolution of a previous group called the League of Nations the United Nations was formed for the purpose of preventing wars that's it so if anyone had a conflict they would come together at the United Nations the city the United Nations Council would get together discuss the problems and then work it out diplomatically so there's no one fight anymore that was the purpose however the United Nations has evolved into something that I simply want to call the global government the United Nations is now a government but it is the government of the world because they are no longer just preventing wars they want to prevent you from believing what you believe they want to get involved in your national social standards your economic programs your educational programs your culture and your spiritual standards they want to get involved in everything and they want to dictate to you what you will be how you will be what you will believe what you will not believe what you will accept what you won't accept and it doesn't matter what your government says the United Nations ignores your national belief systems your economic standards and they impose on you what they demand that you do if they claim you want to be accepted by the community of nations this is very dangerous so basically I have changed the name of the United Nations to the United Conformity of Nations conformity of nations means that globalization is requiring that all nations and societies and people and communities have to conform to the world system so when you use a term like Christian nation that means nothing to the United Nations when you talk about your preamble of your country that means nothing to the United Nations when you talk about your spiritual national heritage that means nothing to the United Nations their position is you conform or you starve starvation means that they won't allow you to enter opportunities in the World Bank they will restrict you from opportunities for international loans for your local programs they will prevent you from getting involved in world trade organization in other words they can starve you to death as a nation if you don't conform conformity is dangerous write it down conformity demands the surrender of your convictions your values your beliefs your principles your morality and your distinctions conformity means I don't exist anymore you form me this therefore destroys the uniqueness of a people in other words in the Bible there is a principle called one world government it is in the Bible as a principle I'm not much into prophesying and all the prophecy stuff but believe me I'm beginning to think this is very possible and close because the UN is really setting themselves up to become the world government and in a way that there's going to be what I believe the cause of war not the prevention of war because some countries especially these Islamic countries and Hindu countries are going to resist the United Nations and instead of bringing peace people are going to resist the pressure to conform and they're going to literally pick up arms and they're going to fight the United Nations um, peacekeeping forces and burn down the headquarters and people don't understand that not everybody is willing to conform now I don't know about the small states in the Caribbean but when you are small states sometimes you think your size is all you got but let me tell you something 
You don't need to be big to be great. A country of 350,000 people beat a nation of 350 million in the Olympics. Which means if God could do it in sports, y'all ain't hear me. He could do it economically, he can do it socially, and most of all, he can do it spiritually. So conformity means to destroy your uniqueness. I'll write this down, please. The whole world is therefore going through what I call flux, change. Change is always uh, tampering with things that you believe. Let me give you a list of things to write down real quick. We are seeing changes in what I call our traditional values. We also see change in our moral standards or our systems that we have accepted as being workable for us. Change is also affecting our cultural norms. Everybody say cultural norms. That word norms is important. Matter of fact, the word norms is the Hebrew word, root word for law. The word in Hebrew for law is the word nomos, N-O-M-O-S. It actually means that which is normal. That's law. So when God created the Ten Commandments, for example, he was creating what's supposed to be the cultural norms. In other words, it's supposed to be culturally normal not to commit adultery. It's supposed to be culturally normal not to steal. It's supposed to be culturally normal not to tell lies. These are the Ten Commandments. It's supposed to be culturally normal to take a day off and rest. Culturally normal. You would remember during the a previous government administration when they decided to turn Sunday into a shopping day. And some of you wonder why there was such a, a kind of a, an objection to that. Because our cultural norm was you take a day off. But the government of that day changed that whole norm. They break the normal law that we accepted as normal and now people are dying all over the Bahamas from stress because they don't rest. And Shabbat is referring to rest. It's a cultural norm not to kill yourself trying to make money. Amen. Take a day off. Amen. Some of you pay for a house and never enjoy the house. You pay for a car and don't go cruising. Why? Too busy working for the car. Take a day off for what you work to achieve. So these are cultural norms. We also see uh, changes that are affecting our traditional belief system, our traditional rules, our traditional laws, and that's where the change is affecting us. And here's what I believe is the pursuit of change. The goal of contemporary movement for global social change is to move away from time-tested principles and values that were established by our creator. That's the change. They're trying to get us to move away from what? Time-tested principles and values. Not with these things are being tested to be good for social development. But because we want to change things, we want to change everything. This is very dangerous. Number two, the pursuit of change in our postmodern world is even willing to violate natural law, which I can't believe they're trying to do. In other words, they're trying to tell nature, you will change. The problem with nature is it doesn't listen to you. For example, they're going to pass laws to turn your rectum into an entrance. The problem is your rectum is a natural equipment put in your body by God for garbage disposal. So no law in a courtroom or a law in a senate or a law in a magistrate court or a law in a parliament can transform your rectum into an entrance. You can use it for what you want to, but you can't change his natural law. They're trying to change the natural law of procreation. A male and a female produces children. You can't pass a law and say, no, I'm going to make two males. Because natural law ignores your law, and you too can't produce. So you got to borrow other people's children or adopt them. Thirdly, change is inevitable. We got to understand that. But we should never be 
changing at the expense of principles. Principles are eternal. Let me explain what I mean real quick. You were created by God to continue to create by not violating his laws. God gave you the power to rule the earth, but not against his laws. Secondly, the creator expected growth and progress within the context of divinely inherent natural laws. God wants you to grow. He wants you to progress within the context of law. Thirdly, true change is growth and development within the boundaries of inherent natural and spiritual laws. That's true development. For example, you may want to drill for oil in the waters of the Bahamas. That's a developmental decision. But you also got to remember that that oil might spill and kill the reefs. The reefs will therefore, if they die, will destroy our fish. The fish therefore being dead will deplete our source of protein. Which means that our kids now will become malnutrition and you'll have to import food from other countries who will make money of you just to feed your kids and you'll be at the mercy of them if they want to feed you. Just because of a developmental decision on oil. So there's some laws in place that nature has that God put in there. And this leads to number four, write it down. Natural and spiritual laws are protected by conscience and creation. You know when you're doing something wrong. You can't tell me that if you violate a natural law, your conscience don't talk to you. The problem is you ignore the conscience. Whatever you do in secret that is wrong, naturally, you know it's wrong. But you still do it. Either because of pleasure or because of pressure. Your conscience is the voice of God. And when we violate, when we pollute a river, when we... When we throw garbage in the ocean from our boats, deep in our hearts we know something's wrong with this. When we throw a cup out of the window, something goes off in your head saying, you should have kept that cup until you got home. But you violate the conscience and you dump the cup. But your conscience is built in by God to keep our convictions in order. That leads me to the next point. Change. Write this down. To advance and progress and develop, change is necessary. I am not against change. But here's the issue you must remember. And that is this. All true change must occur within the boundaries of natural and spiritual principles and laws. There's got to be some law that protects you from changing yourself right out of oblivion. You will violate just for pleasure. Listen. Smoking grass is pleasurable. Taking cocaine, woo, the high cannot be described. Shooting heroin in your veins give you a, a feeling it's like going to heaven. These are all pleasures. But the cost of the pleasure, you violate the laws of your body. And your body shuts down and you become a vegetable walking the streets, staggering in the night or in the day, selling your bodies for another hit or selling your mother's telephone and television for another hit. You violate everything just for pleasure because you think that there's no law. There's a law that restricts every act. This is why it's important for us to not violate those laws that God established. Let me put it this way. No, not all change is improvement or advancement or progressive development. Not all change. So we got to decide what things we should change, what we should not change. And this is what I want you to remember this. Everything will change. But the paradox is change is only possible where something is constant. That means we must be careful what we change. Not everything should be changed. And some things we created to remain unchanged. Do you agree? Yes, sir. Suppose I decide to change your nose and turn it upside down. And then it rains. What will happen to you? You will drown. See? So don't you ever change your nose. I don't care how much cosmetic surgery you get. Don't turn your nose upside down. Why? There's a natural law. Rain comes down. 
Okay, so there are some things you need to be careful with. Some things were created to remain the same and never change. And number six, never confuse change with growth. Write that down. Yes, never confuse what? Change with growth. Some folks say, well, for us to grow as a country, we need to change everything. That is a lie. Don't you ever believe that? Change is not necessarily growth. For example, you used to weigh 120. And then you change 180, 200. Now you grew. But that's not to your benefit. The doctor says, we got, a, we got a problem with your heart, a problem with your blood pressure, we got a problem with all of your, 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 your arteries now. You're about to get yourself into problems with diabetes. So not all change is growth. Another example. Do you know what a tumor is? A tumor is a good cell that grew too fast. That's all a tumor is. A tumor is not a bad cell. It's a good one. But something went wrong in the chromosome combination that coded for multiplication and that cell grew too quickly and therefore became a parasite to the body. It sucks the blood out of the blood system and it becomes a cancer. So you have growth, but it was not development. Now, what do we mean by this then? Write this down, please. Ten things you should never change. Let me give them to you. Number one. Ten things. Number one, never change precepts. Number two, never change principles. Number three, never change purposes of things. For example, the purpose of a knife is to cut things like meat and vegetables. Don't change to cut people's throats. A car was created for the purpose of mobilizing you from point A to point B according to the laws of the traffic rules. You don't use your car to dash down the road and kill five people on your way. In other words, don't change the purpose of it. Your car was created to drive on the road, not on the ocean. Now the problem is you got the power, the will, to drive your car off the dock into the water no one can stop you your personal will this is your car you got your rights you are free go ahead now drive your car 50 miles per hour off the dock and tell the car keep going the car say you know something i am built for the purpose of floating so both of us going down and both of us gonna die don't ever change the purpose of something the purpose for your rectum is excretion not pleasure. Yes, sir. But you change the, the purpose for it, then you end up in disease and all kinds of mental problems and, 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 and abuse of your body for pleasure. You know, someone said to me, you know, I could fly. I said, yeah. He said, man, if I jump off this building, 50 story feet, I, I could fly like Superman. I said, that's exactly right. You will fly at least for three minutes or three seconds. You will fly. The pleasure of flying. Yippee! Free to fly. But you violated a law called gravity. There are some things you should not change. Number, number five, you should not change truth. What is truth? Truth is original information. You can't change it. Number six, don't ever change your roots. Go back to your roots. Number seven, you cannot change foundations. Leave the foundations alone. This building and your house and your office building are built on foundations. You can't change those foundations. Number eight, don't ever change the source of, 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 of things in life. Number nine, you cannot change spiritual laws. Number ten, you cannot change conscience. One thing with conscience, you could suffocate it, but it'll never die. You can't change it. And number 11, that's number 10, eh? Number 11, a fish can never outgrow water. You ever seen a fish saying, I tired of water, I've been here for 50 years. I won't walk on land now. And men are trying to do things like that, you know? I'm tired of doing this. This, this is old. This is archaic. You all still believe in God, but the fish still believe in water. You know how old water is, boy. 
Hey, shark, why are you still in water? You know how old water is? You've been in the water for two million years. You're still in water? Why don't you grow up and come out of water? That's how men are. We're so stupid. We said, like, you know, well, you know, we, you all still believe in that stuff? You still believe in one man, one woman? Are you crazy? You can't live no one person for the rest of your life. You can't stay in water all your life, shark. And so you violate it. You violate it. Now you get kids in four houses. And it's Christmas time. And everybody's calling. Because you violated the law. What do you say, Pastor Rich? Fish smarter than man. <laughs> Give Rich a hand. That's a good one. Write that down. Put it on Facebook right now. Put, send it up right now. Fish smarter than man. Turn your, TV, turn your phone on. Send something up to somebody right now. In other words, we believe that we're smarter than fish. There's some things you cannot change. Here's another one. A tree can never outgrow its roots. No matter how big the tree becomes, it can never say, I'm tired of my roots. I've been in a hundred year old tree. These roots are old. I'm getting out of here. There's some things you cannot change. A building cannot decide to outgrow its foundation. In other words, we need to understand that Proverbs says this. Proverbs says, do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your ancestors. I wonder why that's in the Bible. Because God knew that this generation would try to move them. Do you know what's an ancient boundary stone? Male and female getting married. Yeah. Why is that ancient stone? Because they can't reproduce no other way. Here's another verse. Jeremiah 6 verse 16 says, This is what the Lord says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in them. People stand up and dare to change everything. How dare you tell him what to do? It's not me. It's law. It's nature yes. telling you what to do. No one can control my life. No one's controlling your life. It's nature. It's built in. It's inherent. You can't just walk away from it. Some of you go to work. And on your job, there are people who got weird, strange beliefs. Eh? Take the teaching to them. Don't argue with them. Tell them, look, I'm not arguing with you. There's some things you can't change no matter what you try. You can't convince me to change law. That's natural. This is why I have a problem with those who are trying to implement issues like same-sex marriage. I'm not against their decision to shack up. But to get me to make it equal to me and my wife is an abomination. It's, it, it, it cannot be right to call it the same thing. It ain't the same thing. Call it something else. Call it matrimonial shack up or something. But don't call it marriage. Because marriage is supposed to be a reproductive union. Hmm. Look at it. He says, he says, stand at the crossroads. That's where we are right now. Trying to decide what to do with many issues. Abortion. I heard it come up the other day. Abortion. Many doctors in the Bahamas are committing abortion. Listen, brother, that's murder. Period. Murder. Let me read a scripture for you, doctor. Here's a scripture. It's found in Psalm 139, verse 5. Here it says. It says, For he saw my unformed body while I was yet in the depths of my mother's womb. He knew me, and every day of my life was written in a book before I was born. That's in the Bible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That means you are not terminating a pregnancy. You are destroying a destiny already written in a book by God. Yes, sir. My mother. 11 children, 11 kids my mother had. I am number six. Suppose my mother said to my daddy, five is enough. We in Bain Town in this wooden house. I ain't having no more kids for you. That's enough. Five is too much. Six gotta go. She would have been destroying 57 best selling books. <laughs> Doctor, what destiny are you killing this week in that secret room? 
Who are you killing? And I say to the young woman who getting uh, an abortion, how dare you touch a property? That property ain't yours. That baby did not sin. You sinned. The Bible says all children are heritage of the Lord. Amen. That means they are God's property by right. Yes, yes, yes. You don't touch another man's property because it's, you are inconvenienced. I say to every doctor, may the Lord bring judgment on you if you kill another child in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad my mother didn't abort me. at this one. Proverbs 22 says, verse 28, do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your forefathers. Different verse. Forefathers. You know, when the forefathers were with us the other day, sitting here on the stage, one of them says, I don't know why they're trying to change this. They don't understand this yet. What he's saying is, you don't know the price we paid for this. Don't just change stuff because you want to change it in your administration. Check, see if it really needs to change. Or if you even understand it. Colossians 2 verse 8. Read out loud with me please. Out loud. Go. See it is that no one takes your, you captive through hollow deceptive philosophy. Which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. That's a very important verse. Paul says don't allow people to, to have no long explanation to mess up your belief system. They come out technical thinking, well, you know, well, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the children having babies, you know, and children can't bring up babies, you know, so, you know, that's why we got to abort them, you know, you know, wait a minute. Well, you know, uh, uh, if a woman is raped, you know, you got to kill the baby, you know, because she was raped, you know. Listen, I understand all the ramifications of what the trauma could be. I don't know all the answers to this. But do you know that James Robinson on TV was a victim of a rape? His mother was raped and he was born. James Robinson, who was one of the largest ministries in the world, and he helps millions of children who are poor. His mother was raped and she kept him. He's changing the world. Do not listen to their what? Their deceptive philosophies. They get in the House of Assembly and they talk all this big talk. They get in Senate, in, 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 in the Congress, and they talk all this big talk. They get on the TV stations and the radio, all this big talk. God says, be careful with their deceptive philosophy. Why? It says they depend on human traditions, their own convictions. And then it says they walk according to the basic principles of the other system. Instead of Christ. If anybody had reason to be aborting a child, it was Mary. Because she couldn't explain where the baby came from. The whole village was talking about her. Suppose Mary had an abortion. Really, think about it. Even her boyfriend didn't know where the baby came from. He was about to put her away. Thank God she kept the child. That's why you're saved today. Thank God my mother kept me. 50,000 people in Honduras a few days ago. A government listening to me. She could have killed that. Change. Write this down, please. Very important. Here's what principles are. Principles are first law. Original rule, foundation law, they are inherent laws. In other words, principles are natural laws. They are creation laws. You can't change them. And you should never change a principle because a principle is stable. Here's what Jesus said. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. Matthew 5, 17. I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. And I tell you the truth, unless heaven and earth disappears, not one small letter nor the least stroke of the pen will any by, by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and laws and teaches others to break them is called least in my kingdom. But if anyone teaches those who keep them and they practice those laws themselves, they shall be called what? Great in the kingdom. He says, law, law, law. Keep laws, keep laws. 
we get this idea that grace cancels law. Christ says no. Grace enforces laws. Grace was given so you could keep laws again. The laws of God. I'm not talking about ritual laws. I'm talking about the natural laws and the spiritual laws of God. They are still in force. And listen to me. We live in an age of what we call rights. Hey boy, say rights. What is a big one, eh? I want my rights. I got a right to marry who I want to marry. I got a right to sleep where I want to sleep. I got a right to smoke marijuana. I got a right. I got a right. Everybody got a right. They gonna soon ask for rights to sleep with dogs. And because you're in democracy, they got to give it to them. Because they can argue the same foundation as anything else. I have a right. Write this down. It's very important. Not all rights are protected. What did I say? Not all rights should be protected. No. <laughs> so Vincent Churchill said something, and I heard it this week. I read it. He said, democracy is the worst form of government except the others. What he's saying is, it ain't no different either. It's just the best one that we got. So don't you glorify and use democracy as the end of all your matters. Democracy itself has its own built-in destruction. Now, I love democracy. Thank God for it. But we, we shouldn't trust it without God. Because democracy is really humanism without laws. Where the humans decide who's in power and what is right. And we can't live that way because we ain't that smart. There's got to be a higher reference we use to protect ourselves from ourselves. Everything can be right. Am I right? Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Your son to 18. I got a right to leave home. Really? <laughs> and he fly in your face. <laughs> not, not all, all rights ain't right. Write this down, please. Not all rights are right because rights must be regulated. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I wonder why you don't jump up that 10-story building. Tell me why. Sometimes, you know, we be in them hotels in different parts of the world and you walk out on the porch, you know, you look down, 20 stories. What goes through your mind? Yeah, it goes through my mind too. Boy, I wonder how I'd feel to just jump. And then my conscience says, I dare you. Go by yourself. I stay up here. <laughs> you got a right to jump. You have a right to jump. No one's stopping you. But not all rights are right. Ladies and gentlemen, rights without righteousness is destruction. Because Corinthians says this, 1 Corinthians 9, one of my most favorite verses, verse 12. It says, I have the right to do anything. I'm quoting the Bible. You say, but not everything is beneficial. Let me quote it again. It's from the Bible, okay? Listen carefully. 1 Corinthians 9, 12. I have the right to do anything I want. But not everything is beneficial. Can you say it with me out loud? I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. I have a right to smoke cigarettes. I can, write, I don't, you, I can smoke cigarettes if I don't smoke cigarettes. I was thinking about that you know, this morning, meditating. I was thinking, cigarettes. You got a right to cigarettes. I mean, the government gives you permission to smoke cigarettes. Then they got to deal with your lung cancer and spend billions of dollars on your health care afterwards. This government mentality is strange. You can smoke cigarettes and kill yourself and then we'll pay for you while you're dying. <laughs> this is logic. Alcohol can be sold to an 18-year-old. Okay, no problem. That's a law. You can walk into a bar room at 18 and buy all the hard liquor you want. No restrictions on what you buy. And at 21, you're an alcoholic. Which means now that you are begging on the streets, you're getting social support from taxpayers, and you are killing your liver with cirrhosis, and now the hospital can take care of you, which we're paying for, and you got to be on that machine that we paid for, and the government made sure you had access to the liquor. Yeah. I don't understand the logic sometimes. 
Don't forget now, you got a right to drink, right? You got a right to smoke, right? I find it ironic. So you got a right to smoke. They say, but now on the label, this could kill you. <laughs> Do you understand the logic? Smoke, but it could kill you. And while they're killing you, we can pay for you in the hospital with our tax money. The logic. The Bible says, God has made the, the wise foolish. And we sit and debate this stuff for hours. And then we come up with a conclusion. And the conclusion is what we get. Be wise. He says, I will not do anything that doesn't benefit me. Look at the last part. Read it loud. Go. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be a mastered or mastered by anything. In other words, I have a right to smoke. But I shouldn't become an addict. The Bible it covers everything. People say, well, I don't see you in the Bible where I say you shouldn't, you know, smoke marijuana. See it right there? Anything that interferes with your natural chemical balance in your body should not take part in your body. Let me say it again. Anything that interferes with the natural chemical balances in your body and your brain should not enter your body. Clear it in there? So whether smoking grass or smoking tobacco or drinking standard. Yeah, I grew up in Bain Town, Mom, you know, standard was the standard. Open the bottle, smoke come out. Fella drink it, smoke come out. This is, you know, the logic, ladies and gentlemen, around the world, the logic doesn't make sense to me. Sometimes I feel like going into government to sit in the parliament just to change the conversation to logic. Because somehow we got some educated people, some wonderful people in the House of Assemblies and, and in the Senate and stuff like that. And I'm wondering, what happened to the education? Did they, I mean, what happened? Is it, is your brain goes on freeze when you get in there? Don't you ask the right questions? I call it righteous rights. Jesus came to earth to restore what I call true north, right? Matthew says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his, and all these things shall be what? He says, seek first what? The kingdom and his. The word righteous means alignment with divine law. Write that down. It doesn't mean to wear long clothes and look ugly. It means, come on lawyers, talk to me. To be righteous means you line up with the laws of the government. That's righteousness. So when you talk about rights, rights should be aligned with righteousness, Jesus says. And if you do that, everything you need in your life will come to you. So the first thing you, you and I must do individually and corporately and nationally is to identify righteous divine laws. That's why the first thing God gave Moses to begin a country was not power or even money or anything. He gave Moses law first. Because once you get law, then that becomes the alignment for all of your other laws. Righteous laws create penal codes. They create hygiene laws. They create everything else. But if you keep shifting true north, then there's no north. Therefore, there's no direction. Whenever you move true north, there's no direction. So righteousness is true north. It means that you align yourself with God's word. Matter of fact, the Bible says his righteousness. Not your referendum. Yeah, but Brother Miles, we don't want religion in politics. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down. Now, I, I respect you as a smart, intelligent person. I assume you studied history. I'm assuming that. I'm assuming you studied all history. I'm assuming that too. And I think you would agree with me that the Bible is a historical book, not a religious book. 
And I think you'd agree with me that if you read the history of the Bible, which we steal most of our substance from, you would agree that Moses was never commanded by God to start a religion. Never. I think you agree with that historically. God told Moses, go get those slaves and I'm going to create a nation out of them. True? That's in the document. A nation. Not a religion, a nation. And the first thing God gave Moses to establish a nation was ten laws. These are not religious laws. These are national, social, cultural, educational laws. And they're so good, we are using them still. So don't tell me about mixing religion with, 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 with government. <laughs> this ain't religion I'm talking about. True north is his laws. People have this strange argument. Well, if you put on the books, don't commit adultery. So many people doing it. So? So don't put it there. What? Okay. That means take off the books, thou shalt not steal, because people teeth him. <laughs> Come on, y'all go with me. Clap before I go. You know, Bahamians committing adultery all over the place, brother. All kind of sweethearts. Don't even put it on the books. Don't put it in law. Then take off teeth and do. Because they're breaking into your house and stealing your copper. Logic doesn't make sense. The logic doesn't make sense. You don't change laws because of violation. It is the laws that are preventing more violation. Listen, I saw you, not you, the one behind you. I saw you running the red light the other day. So many payments run red lights. So get rid of lights. No, no but that's what they're saying. Send so many people running it. Let's get rid of it. Don't put it in the books. Fella came around me the other day. Behind me, I'm at the stop sign. Fell I said, okay. I guess that ain't no stop sign. So move all the stop signs. You don't change law because of violators of law. The problem is not violation. The problem is judgment. You're not enforcing. Listen to a story the other day, interesting story about uh, this, this plant they, they, they plant in Pakistan uh, that they, they sniff. What do they call that plant? It's not heroin, it's worse than heroin. No, it ain't cocaine, it ain't cocaine. Opium. And they say, man, so many people growing opium, they, they, they can let it become legal. And they say, most of the folks in their country don't smoke it. They shipping it out. Export, import dollars to destroy other nations. You don't surrender to illegality because you can't enforce it. You got to enforce. I mean, it's, it's, it's like your children, you know, when we throw our little tantrum, you know, in bed down, you throw a little tantrum on the floor. My mother said, look at you once, get up. That's what she said, get up. And you're on the floor, ah! Mother said, it's the last time I can tell you, get up, go sit in the corner. And you throw your tantrum. All of a sudden, you go pick your head up off the, on the corner, the head over there rolling. You pick up your head, you put it back on, you sit in the corner. <laughs> hey, boys, enforcement. Enforcement. Clap, man. We need one of them in the country. Knock your head. Go pick it up. <laughs> That's why I obey law today. She didn't entertain my tantrum. My, my wife and I, my wife was probably this one. We flying on the aircraft the other day coming here. Little girl in front of us screaming, man. I pay all my money for this flight. All my money I pay to sit up here. Yeah! 
I said, now, my wife, calm down, please. <laughs> my wife says, <laughs> she was a Bahamian girl. <laughs> I tell her, store this one second, I go in the bathroom, take the child in the bathroom. Boom, come back out, quiet. <laughs> and these two people are there talking to the child like she's an adult. Hi. You don't have discussions with few foolishness. And according to the Bible, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. You don't, you, you don't negotiate with foolishness. <laughs> Y'all clap, man. I feel lonely up here in a second. <laughs> you don't talk about it? Yeah. His laws, so we'll be lying ourselves up with. I want you to get this one. Write this down, please. I have the right to do what? Anything he says again. But not everything is beneficial. Look at the last part. But do everything is everything constructive he changed the word in this verse is everything constructive no one should seek their own good but the good of the whole community yes. I'm, I'm reading from the bible now this is what i call personal rights versus community rights let me read it again i have the right to do anything you say but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own interests, but the interests of others also. Now what it's saying is, there's some rights that you are demanding that is not good for the community. For example, if two people of the same sex get married, and this becomes the pervasive uh, condition in the future then the human race will decline so the whole community will die because they can't reproduce so even though you got your personal right you kill everybody else not all rights are right what is in the interest of everybody else that's what God is after when God said don't commit adultery he's thinking about the whole community he thinking about them, you know, you breaking up another man's family, messing up the children, destroying the economic balance in the home, violating the salaries, you messing up the house, psychological problems, criminal results. He said, you're messing up the whole country. Stay with your wife. That statement is a social national security statement. Don't commit adultery. And there are people in this room who could tell you they, they, they can testify. It's hell on earth. Trying to survive that thing is hell on earth. And there are women here who know the pain. And the children who know the pain. And God says, don't do it. This is not some religious law. This is a social, civic, economic law. He said, don't do it. Is it good for everybody else? That's the question. I have a right to walk down Bay Street with no clothes on. Okay. Yeah, but is that, is that good for everybody? That ain't good for everybody. I have a right to sell drugs to who I won't sell it to. Yeah, but is that good for everybody? I have a right to teach homosexuality as acceptable in a classroom with a five-year-old. Is that right for those small minds? That is child abuse. You are imposing concept of a child that they cannot themselves intellectually decipher. Is it right for everybody? Not just you. All of God's laws are good for the common good. Put that on Facebook right now. All of God's laws are good for the common good. Every one of them. When God says don't steal, that's good for everybody, eh? Right? If God says don't lie, that's good for everybody. If God says don't commit adultery, that's good for everybody. If God says don't kill, oh, that's especially good for everybody. Every law of God. Take a day off and rest, that's good for everybody. Go on the beach, go swim, go read a book, go pray, take a day off. That's good for everybody. All of God's laws are good for everybody. These are not religious laws. These are national laws. 
right. okay let's look at this last part here he says not everything is beneficial I want you to, to study every law and see how beneficial it is or how unbeneficial it is he said not all things are constructive study of all the laws you see which ones construct build community rather than destroy community he said any right that is not constructive and doesn't benefit everyone is not a right it's a violation my prayer to you is that every law of God should be good for others every law we make in our country should be good for everybody not just good for a few good for the majority the problem with with uh, democracy is this verse right here because democracy says you got to make room for that two percent and this verse says but the two percent don't benefit everybody no. so it contradicts the two percent two percent of the population want same-sex marriage 98 percent don't want it God says it doesn't benefit everybody it can become a right you have a right to do it but not a right to impose it on the 98 percent your will can do anything but don't impose your will on the majority Can I challenge the young people in this place? Can you all please invent another form of government, please, better than democracy? I have one. I can recommend it soon. Because what we have is going in the wrong direction all over the world. And that's why people are rising up. Egypt, first test of democracy. The present lasted one year. And the people said, we, we, we don't like the direction you're going in. Do you know something? I have a funny feeling in a few years that could happen here in the, in the Caribbean. People say to the government, wait a minute. That ain't what we voted you in for. So maybe the term might be as long as the people allow it. That's what happened in Egypt. It's no longer four-year guarantee terms. It's what the people expect you to do. You promise certain things. You promise you wouldn't do certain things either. And now you start doing them. The people say, you know something? This is it. You're gone. Forget them terms. Because you break the terms of our agreement. Am I making sense? Yes, sir. This scripture is powerful. It says you only have a right if it benefits everybody. Not just your little private sector. God is so faithful. Let me close with this. Philip Psalm says what? Read. The arrogant mock me. This is Psalm 119 with 51. For those at home. Psalm 119 with 51. Read it loud. Go. The arrogant mock me unmercifully. But I do not turn from your law. Remember Lord your ancient laws. And I find comfort in them. Indignation grips me because of the wicked who have forsaken your law. David says, I become indignant when people start meddling with your time-tested laws. Yes. Don't sit down and be quiet is what he's saying. He become indignant because of your ancient laws being violated. The word ancient needs to be redefined, you know. Ancient doesn't mean out of date. Ancient means it is so good, it's still there. Yes. Clap, man. That's a good definition. <laughs> Ancient doesn't mean it ain't useful or contemporary. Ancient means it is so excellent, you cannot improve on it. Yes. That's ancient. Your laws, your ancient laws that are so perfect cannot be changed. And people are trying to what? They try to change it, he says. I become indignant. I fight against them because I know the benefit of this law. This law is constructive. It helps us. Proverbs 22 verse 28, read. Do not move the ancient stones.
The boundaries set by ancestors. The boundaries. Hey, boys, say boundaries. boundaries. You know, as children, we hate boundaries, eh? And even as adults, we hate boundaries. They pass the mouse, them teach against this thing too hard. I ain't going back there. I'm sorry. This ain't my boundary. This is. See you later. I ain't changing the boundaries for you. Your personal rights is not, not important, more important than righteousness. Let's say like Joshua. Choose you this day who you must serve. Boy, what a young man that was. The guy was tough. He talking to three million people. Choose you today who you will serve, he says. As for me and my house. Come on, say it with me. As for me and my house. You'll do what? I can't hear you all. You will do what? Let the devil hear it. We will serve the Lord. In other words, I can't choose for you, he says. But I'm going to make my decision right now. Anybody can make their decisions today? We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Glory a Dios. Thank you once again for listening to this message, as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.